what we do this week sets us apart from most other religions, sets us apart from other mythologies or, or mythologies, and sets us apart from philosophies. Because tonight, in fact, this whole week, we remember a historical event. We talk about what really happened. We can point to the time and the place and the people involved. Tonight, I would like to begin in an unusual place for a Good Friday commemoration. I want to actually start with a conversation that takes place Sunday evening on a road headed outside of Jerusalem to a little town called Emmaus. It's about seven miles outside of Jerusalem. It takes about two hours to walk. As the scripture says that there were two disciples who were walking along this road, heavy in their hearts with the memory and images and sounds of Friday still echoing in their ears. And now they have heard strange stories of an empty tomb and visions of angels. And all that has happened is simply too bewildering for them. Now, of course, we have the advantage of knowing what's happening. We also know that the stranger who joins them on the road at this point is Jesus, though somehow his identity is withheld from them and they don't recognize him. And Jesus, when he arrives and overtakes them, begins to talk to them, and he's a little bit playful with them. He remains disguised and draws near and pre pretends to have no idea what they're talking about. As he says, what is this conversation that you are discussing so intently? As if he doesn't know. They're puzzled. He's clearly coming from Jerusalem. The entire city was in an uproar at Passover over the young prophet and would-be Messiah. Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know about the things that have happened the, there in these days? Says Cleopas, one of the disciples. Now, knowing full well what has happened, and knowing that he is the topic of discussion, Jesus continues to play along. What things? Now, at first I chuckle. I mean, Jesus is having fun with them, right? What things? I have no idea what you're talking about. He's, you know, disguised somehow supernaturally. And surely as readers who know the story, we're meant to pick up on the humor too. But as we pray into this and meditate upon this, we realize there's something else going on. Jesus does not rush them to an answer. He's not quick to reveal himself. He does not immediately jump forward with good news. It's not what you think. He doesn't try to say to them, it's okay, God is in control. Don't you hate that? When your world is wrecked and rocked and some superficial, super spiritual, know everything. It's okay. God is in control. God is another person for you. God is good. It's all okay. God will fix this. God has another job, another relationship, whatever. And you just want to ring them. <clears throat> Why? <coughs> is it because we have some sadistic desire to just wallow in our pain? No. The truth is we do not wish to be rushed out of our grief because we want the loss to be honored, to be remembered, to be known. And we want to be able to voice our pain. In part, we want to cry out in order to be healed, but we also want to cry out so that what is lost is honored and not forgotten. You know, and it's right that we do this. We rightly display the image of God when we slow down and notice what was lost. 
We reflect our Father when we grieve. For he is the one who walked the garden and said, Adam, where are you? What have you done? Jesus does not rush them along. What things, he asks. He makes room for their grief. He opens the door for them to raise their voices and lament the loss and express their confusion. He's not disturbed by their pain, bothered by their grief as if it somehow makes him less secure. He invites it. He listens. I'm a cradle Pentecostal. And I wouldn't trade that for the world. But everybody has, you know, every tradition has a little bit of a temptation, right? And I can tell you that as Pentecostals, one of the temptations that we have is to skip the ugly parts. We just want to shout. Let's just get to the shouting. Let's just make it happy clappy and we'll all be good. Jesus doesn't let us do that. What things, he says. What things? What troubles you? That's why at the conclusion of this service, we're going to end a little bit different. We're going to end in silence and let you go into Saturday in silence. It won't last forever, but it does need to last a little bit. We had hoped that he was the one who would redeem Israel, they said. We had hoped. There are different kinds of hope. We might hope for good weather. We might hope for a gift on our birthday. We might hope that the Seahawks will win the Super Bowl. I'm from Washington, what can I say? I know, you're thinking somebody else, but we won't mention that name. We might hope our children will come home. We might hope the medical report will change. We might hope that we will be loved. Do you see the different gradations of hope? And it seems that the higher the thing hoped for, the deeper within us it resides. Deep within us we hope that God has not forgotten. Deep within us, we hope that he is with us. We hope that evil will be vanquished. We hope that justice will be done. We hope that bad will be undone. We hope that God will redeem. The scripture tells us that hope deferred makes the heart sick. The higher the shattered hope, the deeper the sickness we experience. But we had hoped he was the one. Maybe as you're listening, you are becoming aware of your own deferred hope. Maybe you're becoming aware of this depth of a sickness of a deferred hope. Listen as Jesus asks you tonight, what things What hope have you lost? Where does it hurt? As he tends to do, Jesus surprises them with a statement and a question. He first of all says, O foolish ones and slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. I can tell you that's not what we teach people to do in pastoral counseling and seminary. But Jesus can get away with things that we just can't. Thing is, Jesus wants them to understand something about their pain. And so he follows that statement up with a question. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Was it not necessary? We, would, we want to say no. No. In fact, we want to scream, no, 
No, it was not. Christ could have come in a blaze of glory and suffered nothing. <clears throat> but when we say this, we reveal that we are thinking with a broken wisdom and a flimsy strength. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So Jesus reminds them of the strength and wisdom of God, again, without yanking them out of the pain by revealing who he is. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Was it not necessary? Jesus wants us to face this. The road to redemption is a painful road. Jesus' suffering is redemptive. He is taking on brokenness that he might heal it. He unwinds the coil of our sin, but that means he must undo the knot. He must walk it backwards, which requires him to go through all the jagged, broken places, even though that means torment for him. Consider how his wounding is our healing, his loss, our restoration, his humiliation our exaltation. Isaiah the prophet speaking in the voice of the servant Messiah said, I, the Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike. You see, the gospels say that Pilate ordered Jesus to be scourged but the gospel writers assume that we remember the scriptures and that we know what's really happening. And the fact is Jesus gave himself over to be scourged. He said yes to the path that led to a pillar where he was chained and beaten with whips embedded with iron and glass and bone. The psalmist said the plowers plowed upon my back. They made long their furrows. But something mysterious and divine is happening in midst this bloody violence inflicted by human hands. And here is the mystery of love. Isaiah tells us in the passage we read at the beginning of the service that it was in his wounding that we were healed. Through his lashing, Jesus is healing the disfigurements that hurt us. The wounds of body, <coughs> the wounds of mind, the wounds of soul, the wounds we receive, and the wounds we inflict, the wounds of his own body, the church. You see, we do not experience our pain alone, and neither is our pain without hope. He is with us even in this. In the beginning, when all was fair and lush and green, man and woman walked the garden and in peace and ruled with love. But when they had fallen away, their hold over earth was broken, and so the soil itself revolted and gave to the farmer thorns instead of wheat and thistles instead of fruit. You know, we see it's easy to criticize our leaders, those who lead, whether we're talking in the secular world or the church or the job or school. It's easy. It's easy to become discouraged and despair. It's easy to fling sharp criticisms with little thought to the damage that they will cause. And sometimes with precise care, knowing exactly the pain it will inflict. Yet when we are honest, we see the thorns in our own areas of leadership. We're not the managers we ought to be. We're not the parents we want to be. 
We fail to govern our own passions as we know we must. We understand that our best efforts in leading and governing ourselves are well described by the prophet Micah who said, the best of them is like a briar and the most upright of them a hedge. We need not point the finger at others for they, these words describe ourselves. This wrongness, this bad fruit of our own governance, each individual, Jesus takes upon himself as well. You see, our crowns yield thorns. So Jesus makes them his crown. He walks the road of our failed plans and our malicious schemes and wears our shame and pain upon his brow. In this too, he is making us as we ought to be. He joins us in our failures and wears the painful, shameful thorns of our sins. Judgmentalism, selfish ambition, self-centeredness, abuse of others, Abuse of trust. And here also is the mystery of love. By wearing our crown of thorns, he will fulfill what the prophet Isaiah said. Instead of the thorn shall come the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come the myrtle. And it shall make a name for the Lord and an everlasting sign that will not be cut off. He is with us even in this. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquities of us all. You've probably seen the image of Christ the good shepherd. You know, it's the shepherd carrying the lamb upon his shoulders. It's one of the earliest depictions in Christian art of Jesus. It's beautiful, pastoral. It's been replicated and repeated many, many times. But the artist would not want us to forget what it takes to accomplish being the good shepherd. To come to his wandering sheep and bring them home, Jesus has to walk the painful road of redemption. You see, walking to where we are lost pierced his beautiful feet. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Iniquity in Hebrew carries the idea of bentness, twistedness, erring from the straight way. And erring from the way causes us to be ensnared and and hobbled by our sins. They hold us fast and keep us from doing what we ought. Going astray causes us to be caught in patterns of destruction pierced by addictions, pierced by the need to be liked by everyone, pierced by choices we have made for temporary pleasures that have fastened us in debt and regret, pierced by the pride that binds our feet from moving towards our brothers and sisters to offer words of confession and forgiveness. So Jesus offers his feet to be pierced by the nails hidden in errant paths. He takes those nails too. And here again is the mystery of love. By taking on the piercing of our errant ways, Jesus walks the road to redemption and straightens our path. He is with us even in this. I'm not a carpenter. I try. When I do, my wife gives me a look. She says nice words, but her face betrayeth her. (laughs) What she's thinking is stick to theology, Daniel. But what I mess up with wood does not even compare to the messes I've made in life. 
Our hands were given to us so that we might welcome and caress with affectionate care and give and create. Yet we have used our hands to push away and strike and take and destroy. What have you used your hands for? So the hands of the carpenter, the hands of the word which made the worlds, the hands of the one who healed bodies and multiplied bread and held children are nailed to a tree. Here again is the mystery of love. Fastened to the tree, Jesus' hands are held in benediction so that he might make all things new. He is with us even in this. Naked he hangs upon the cross, his limbs fastened to the wood with nails. He cannot run away, he cannot cover himself, he cannot defend himself. And here in total vulnerability, exposed to the world, powerless in the eyes of the world, he shows that he actually is not truly helpless nor powerless. By embracing apparent powerlessness, he shows us true power. And in these moments, he uses his power to give. He gives forgiveness to his abusers. He gives paradise to the thief. He gives his mother to his disciple. He gives his disciple to his mother. He gives his spirit to the Father. And even in death, he gives his side to be pierced where blood and water flows. Blood and water flowed. The blood of the Passover lamb marked the children of Israel and delivered them from destruction. The water from the stricken rock sustained them in the wilderness. And today in water baptism, we participate in new life and celebrate new life given to us by the Spirit. And in Holy Communion, the Apostle Paul says, we participate in the blood of Christ, 1 Corinthians 10, 16. Mystics have seen the opening of the side of Christ as the opening to his heart. Indeed, just as his side was opened, the veil which closed off the most holy place was torn from top to bottom. The third century theologian Origen said it was from the open side of Christ that the church was born. All of this given for the life of the world. And we who have been enemies of God might think that he would be justified to send us away, and I guess he would. And we are surprised that he doesn't. But it shows how little we understand him. He is the one who gives and gives and gives and gives. And here again is the mystery of love. Even our actions against him are used to open up in, a way into his heart. In his death and in the pouring out of his side, he is opening up the way to new life and new creation. He is powerless in the world's eyes, but his vulnerability is a display of power that is older than time, deeper than oceans, and higher than the stars. This is the power of divine love in which the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have always been and through which they already open themselves to make the world. This is the love redeeming the world. He is with us even in this. Was it not necessary? So what is the invitation of the Lord to us tonight? I think it's this. Surrender to the road to redemption even though it's painful. The invitation is to behold and enter into the mystery of his love. You may have heard, Jesus suffered so I don't have to. Brothers and sisters, that is not the gospel. 
the gospel. <laughs> Peter says, we say, share in his sufferings, 1 Peter 4.12. Paul said, I share in Christ's sufferings, Philippians 3.10. Jesus told us to expect tribulation. The gospel is not that we don't suffer. The gospel is that Jesus shares our suffering. And the gospel is that since we are united to Jesus, we can expect to experience what he experienced after his suffering. Jesus makes room for your grief. He points the way to show that God is in your grief making all things new. The invitation tonight is to allow your pain, your wounds, your sorrows to be united to His so that He can carry you with Him all the way. In a moment, we're going to partake of Holy Communion, but before we do that, I would like for you to spend one minute listening to the Lord. You might want to write something down or just remember it. But let this question work its way into your heart. What wounds does he need to heal? What wounds do you need to unite to his? Amen. I'm going to ask the pastors if they would to come and take their places. We're going to receive communion tonight. Now yesterday, I spent some time already with the elements and praying for them and praying for this service. And so we're in kind of honoring the solemnity and the starkness of Good Friday. We're just going to really simplify what we do. Would you stand with me? Paul said, I received from the Lord what I also delivered from you, to you. That the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We thank you, Father, that you have provided redemption for us through Je your Son, Jesus Christ. As we honor the sacrifice of Christ tonight and look forward to his resurrection, we come to the table. Let us be moved by your love, nourished by your spiritual food, and reconciled to you and to one another through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and through the power of of your Holy Spirit, who live and reign with you forever and ever. Amen. I'm going to invite you, if you want to receive communion this evening, exit out the right of your pew, and then just come down, cross over to the left, receive the elements, and then continue back on your way to your seat. 
We won't be taking it together like we normally do. It's just a little bit different tonight. So when you return to your seat and when you're ready, go ahead and partake. But would you come? A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry holy all creation cries holy forgiven and if you've been redeemed sing the song forever to the Lamb oh, oh. and if you walk in freedom and if you bear his name sing the song forever to the Lamb we'll sing the song forever and amen the angels cry, holy, all creation cries, holy, you are lifted high, holy, holy forever, Ooh. hear your people sing.
to the King of Kings. Holy, you will always be. Holy, holy forever. Ooh, your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your Stands upon the wall, Jesus, all thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands upon the wall, Jesus, your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above. St. Augustine said, as they were looking on, so we too gaze on his wounds as he hangs. We see his blood as he dies. We see the price offered by the Redeemer. Touch the scars of his resurrection. He bows his head as if to kiss you. His heart is made bare open as it were in love to you. His arms are extended that he may embrace you. His whole body is displayed for your redemption. Ponder how great these things are. Let all this be rightly weighed in your mind. As he was once fixed to the cross in every part of his body for you so he may now fixed, be fixed in every part of your soul. Now as we come to the end, we'll have one final reading. As we bring everything down to quiet. This will be your dismissal. When the reading is done, you're welcome to stay in your place or come to the altar. Whenever you want to leave, you're free to leave. But leave in quiet. Wait to, to talk until you're past the lobby and outside for those that may want to, to honor those who may want to stay and just abide in the cross for a little bit, by the cross. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him, and Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is, after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he is risen from the dead and the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go. Make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. <clears throat> 